Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having us here. Uh, my name is Dennis Nazaroff, and I'm the co-founder of Mine. And at Mine, we are building tools to empower creators and organizations with decentralized infrastructure. And we're contributing to the open source development of Media Chain, which is an open data network for creative works. But first, let's talk about sharing. So sharing is at the core of vibrant and open communities. Uh, Wikipedia, for example, is the most thorough encyclopedia ever created in the history of humankind, all completely crowdsourced by a community of participants. Open science has created tremendous innovation through open publishing of research and data. And open source projects are kind of the de facto default for both organizations and developers because of their quality and their community support. And GLAMs are also the champions of sharing. So many of you have shared collections as openly licensed data sets, and DPLA has aggregated over 13 million items from institutions, and Europeana has aggregated over 50 million across the European Union. So open access is a really powerful force, and over a billion works are licensed under the Creative Commons license, and open publishing uh, is included natively in large publishing platforms like YouTube, SoundCloud, Medium, and Internet Archive, Wikimedia Commons. So at the click of a button, natively in those platforms, you can include an open license for your creativity. And open licenses have also been adopted by governments and foundations, such as the White House and Hewlett, Gates, and Ford. So open data results in really awesome projects. Uh, and the New York Public Library Labs, uh, which uh, some of the representatives are at DPLA Fest, um, have been part of a really awesome initiative to open up tons and tons of their data, and that has resulted in some really cool projects like oldnyc.org, uh, which was created by a third-party developer, which took images from NYPL's uh, collection of photographers from New York City and placed them on an interactive map. And what that has created is a completely new way of interacting with the collection. And that has uh, driven hundreds of thousands of users and thousands of people left comments, and uh, there was also an ability to crowdsource typos, so um, text that the developer OCR'd was fixed by users visiting the website. Um, UKOA is a project by John Rezik, who's right there in the audience. Um, really awesome project that took wood blocks from 24 institutions all over the world and aggregated them on one place. Uh, John used uh, computer vision to deduplicate uh, prints made from the same wood block and to group them together, and that has made a uh, tremendous impact on the study of Japanese woodblock prints because now scholars had this one repository to look at all of these things. And that also drove tons of traffic and interaction. And, and projects like these are really proof that if you open up your data that you can create tremendous new value for your institution outside of the confines of the physical collection outside of the walls of your institution. But how we share <coughs> is broken. And 1.1 billion CC license works is really a profound gift, but despite of this, that these works sit disconnected from each other and they live without context, gratitude, or mechanisms for collaboration. And that's because open data lives in silos. So when an institution chooses to publish its data, it uses a proprietary API that you know, speaks its own schema or, or language. And these exist in isolation and no way connected to each other and are in incompatible formats. And even when organizations like DPLA do the hard work of aggregating this, that what really happens is an, another mega silo is formed. And for example, Europeana and uh, DPLA you know, have national boundaries, so they don't communicate in, with each other as well as they could. So while the internet continues to evolve, open data hasn't. And while web services and apps are data-driven and dynamic, open data has largely been static, devoid of analytics, and rooted in difficult markup. And in terms of attributions, users still have to manually attribute when they're sharing content. So in some cases, uh, you know, social media accounts choose to do so, like History and Pics finally gave Stanley Kubrick a credit, but when it's shared in other instances, we don't know the author. And at the same time, we have technology like Shazam, which lets us hold up our phone and have our phone tell us the artist of a song or Google reverse image search that lets us query by an image and learn more data about an image. These technologies are not present part of the open access workflow. 
and analytics are at the heart of all web applications and mobile applications because everyone's obsessed of using metrics to optimize experiences. There's really no analytics about open access because we don't know where that content is going. So adding a work to the commons is a tremendous gift, but the contributors get very little in return. No feedback, no added analytics, not even the like or even the thank you. And what that world looks like is something like this, that everyone's system is in a different shape and sort of on its own, not connected to other ones. And we believe that these efforts can really amount to more. So where can we look for inspiration? Well, social networks have been capitalizing on network effects for years. You know, platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And th these network effects have resulted in increasingly powerful communities and, of course, increasingly powerful corporations. And what they've created is this really valuable feedback loop that every time you share, your sharing is rewarded by likes or comments, and that encourages you to share more. So as more users join the network, the more valuable the sum of all of the actions and the sum of the entire network becomes. And our goal is to create a network effect of open data. And to create something that looks like this, where everyone is in the same shape, everyone speaks the same language, and everyone is interconnected. And that is the goal of Media Chain, which is an open data network for creative works. So the properties of Media Chain are peer-to-peer -peer blockchain infrastructure that is maintained by the contributors to the system instead of a central gatekeeper. Anyone joining the network doesn't need to permission to write to the system or read from the system. And all the statements are made in an append-only fashion where they're signed by the contributor. And this enables anyone to search across all the data sets that are participating in the system or to filter by contributor. So Media Chain is composed of a system called IPFS, a schema translator, and an image resolver, and I'm gonna go into more detail on those. So IPFS, uh, has anyone heard of IPFS? So IPFS is a peer-to-peer -peer networking layer. It uh, combines some of uh, the peer-to-peer -peer technologies behind BitTorrent and Git, and it allows to us to create uh, structured data relationships and to basically create uh, relationships between data points in the system so we can relate objects to other obje objects. And because it's a decentralized network that every participant in the system shares the ownership of the system, there's no central control, central point of control. And that's what, and it's also, uh, IPFS stands for Interplanetary File System, which is a very exciting name. And so the, the properties of such a system enable us to create something that looks like this, where everyone, is a node that retains control, but we are all connected in one logical system. So the schema translator of media chain enables interoperability while preserving the original data structure of the contributed information. And some of you may recognize this XKCD cartoon, which is sort of the classic example of schemas and standards that, you know, uh, a smart new person to the scene notices that there are 14 competing standards and decides that they're gonna solve this problem by creating one universal standard that everyone's gonna use and it's gonna fix all the problems. And it ends up that there are 15 competing standards. And at Media, Media Chain acknowledges that data lives in different representations and basically attempting to reconcile everyone's domains with one schema is not gonna satisfy everyone's concerns. So the schema translator extracts a minimum subset of fields to enable indexing and linking the data. So fields like the, like the author, the date, the movement, so we can query the data while preserving the original data. So if you have 30 other keys in your, in your JSON structure and in your institution that can still live with the data, and you know, if another institution wants to talk to that data, they can write their own translator for it, but no one is forced to destructively adopt a brand new schema. And these translators are, lightweight version and impotent, so they can be modified or improved over time. So the image resolver layer of Media Chain uses image recognition, which returns a single global ID that represents the content of an image. So the Mona Lisa on the left is slightly yellow, yellower, on the right is slightly bluer. To a human, we know that this represents the same artwork. 
but to a machine, a digital fingerprint would be completely different. So image recognition allows very similar representations to resolve to one ID. And that's what enables us to collaboratively talk about a creative work. So today in our open data sets, two institutions may be describing the same artwork, but the way the data lives in silos today that no one knows about it. Media chain using the image resolver allows that data to, to live under one ID so we can surface differences, we can surface errors and enable collaboration like that. So we see media chain as an infrastructure for a data commons. And it enables discovery of data. So if two institutions both have works from Pablo Picasso, now we can query across those institutions very easily because just by virtue of them participating in the system. Attribution becomes native because of the resolver layer. <clears throat> so if someone shares, on, shares an image on Twitter without attribution, Twitter integrates with Media Chain, the author's name can be surfaced automatically. Or if Twitter doesn't, a user can query Media Chain for the image and learn who made it. And this enables the biggest thing is reuse and collaboration. Um, for example, in old NYC, that developer added geocoding to all the images in the collection which were not present in the original data set from New York Public Library Labs. Now this data can coexist with the original data from New York Public Library Labs without modifying it. it. It will maintain the identity of the developer, but it will be in the same space as the original data so anyone can discover it. And we think that this is, this, these features of the system offer profound opportunities for collaboration. Now institutions can surface that they are describing the same artwork, the same movement, they contain information about the same artists and it's, it will be very easy to query this. And a, a quick demo, um, this actually works in a CLI, but I'm just gonna uh, demonstrate the output kind of in these static slides. So imagine two institutions have metadata about the same work. MoMA has this Henri Cartier-Bresson photograph in its collection as well as the Tate. And MoMA has its own flavor of metadata while the Tate has some more extended metadata. The resolver would give these two slightly different images one canonical ID, and both MoMA and Tate will write a, a lightweight translator to translate their common fields to be compatible with other data in media chain. So if we do the command line query, command line command, <coughs> sorry, if we, if we run the command media chain get ID, it will return this JSON response from the system where the common fields are in red that have been translated using a lightweight schema translation, and we can see in blue that the contributor is MoMA. If we add the raw flag, we can see that the original data with much more proprietary fields that are present in the MoMA schema are, are preserved, and if someone wants to write a translator for those fields, they are welcome to do so. And if we run media chain history ID, we get all the revisions in an array. So we see in blue that this is the data from the Tate, and in red the data with the MoMA, the data from MoMA. And I think that this is the really powerful feature of Media Chain that it allows institutions to collaborate and add different statements without you know, stepping on each other's toes or, or destroying each other's data, because it is all assigned by the participants so you know who made what statement. But the fact that you can find this in one place is really powerful and the kind of co collaboration that doesn't exist today. And we think Media Chain is really complementary to the efforts of DPLA. Uh, DPLA is an advocate and authority of op for open uh, cultural data, while we see Media Chain as, as improving the open data publishing workflow. Media Chain enables the preservation of identity and reputation while decentralizing the distribution of the network. We really see it as the very bottom layer and as new pipes for a better and smarter reuse of the data certified by DPLA. So we're here today and you should talk to us to learn more about Media Chain and publishing your data into Media Chain. Um, we're working on a prototype to basically demonstrate the features of the system with actual data and we'd love to use the open data your institution has published. Um, 
the GitHub organization is called Media Chain, where you can see all our open source progress. Uh, we have a public Slack channel where we do our development in the open. And um, if you want to look at some of our blogs, we sort of, I think some of the blogs may more, more coherently explain kind of, um, you know, more institutional facing use cases that might be a little easier to understand than this technical deep dive. So thank you very much. Up next, we have Patrick Murray John. Patrick? Thank you. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Patrick Murray John. I'm a developer uh, mostly for Omeka at uh, Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media. And I just want to share a project that I've been working on in fits and starts to serve as part of the mechanism for getting uh, Omeka 2 to uh, talk better with uh, DPLA. Uh, so starting with the JSON-LD output from DPLA's API, I was working on different ways to turn that into the data to insert items into an Omeka site. So if you get good search results from DPLA, want to remix them in Omeka, basically thinking about a plugin to do that. And the mechanism that I hit on for trying to start that process off, basically how to parse out all of the JSON-LD coming from DPLA, was to use a, a library in PHP called uh, easy RDF. If any of you came to the demo of Omeka S uh, this morning and saw us sucking in lots of RDF data directly into Omeka S, this is the library that Omeka S uses. And so I started with thinking, okay, maybe just extend this easy RDF graph class, do all my parsing there, and use that to generate the PHP to stuff data into Omeka. Okay, that's as far as I got. And so first mission of this talk is to say, this thing exists. If there are any PHP developers who think this is a possible useful direction, please fork uh, send pull requests, ask questions and the issues, uh, and I will, I will address them as best as I can as I am trying to make this thing talk to Omeka. Yeah. There's a second reason that I wanted to talk about this here. This is where I'm gonna do something kind of scary for a lightning talk and ask a question of the audience. Because I found myself thinking in a weird way of, am I really working with JSON as JSON, or am I really working with the graph? So like the approach here is definitely first turn it into a graph, do what I want with uh, RDF, sort of RDF oriented thinking, or, oh, PowerPoint translation didn't work out so well. So I'll just stay here. Um, or is the approach to working with data to really parse out as JSON? So the thing that got lost on the second slide is, do you all think of working with data from DPLA as JSON that's also LD? Or is it linked data RDF that just happens to be serialized as JSON. So I, I hope there's enough developers here to get a show of hands. 
Who's thinking it's Jason? Like primarily Jason, not necessarily RDF. RDFers? Okay, you're 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 cheating down. It's it's it, it's both. Oh, how so? <laughs> okay, so so uh, at least there's not like a strong sense in the developers here of there's could or should be one or the other. You're like taking it equally. Again, sort of depending. You, you, lean, you lean towards Jason, but there's a lot of depends on what you want to do with it. Okay, thank you. This this is fulfilling the gap in my knowledge that I was hoping to hear about in this very quick lightning talk. Thank you very much. as I can exit out of here and get back to the doc. Here's the, here's the second slide on the table. Okay. Yep. All right. My name is Brian Tingle. I work at the California Digital Library. I end, I end up using Facebook a lot, probably a lot more than I'd like to admit. And it's a lot of times when, you, when you're using Facebook, you click on some crazy clickbait article, and it's got a section at the bottom of the article with all of these related well, equally clickbaity titles of sort of sucking you into more and more content. And so the, this little thing I worked on, um, what if uh, the sort of idea was to create um, Outbrain as one of these content promotion networks. And I guess I didn't test this on uh, whatever version of Internet Explorer this is. Oh, here we go. I needed to reload it. So this is just a little a thing I threw together, um, sort of a prototype of a JavaScript library that can take DPLA stuff and the idea is eventually to embed it on a page. I showed this to my product manager on Calisphere and um, she liked it. So we're going to look at incorporating this into Calisphere so that when you're on an item in Calisphere and we have related things in Calisphere, that we'll also have related things in DPLA. And then we also might use this on a zero results search page. So if there's nothing in Calisphere, redo your search in um, DPLA. And show you, you can see the HTML here, maybe not too well, can I? No, Alt plus. I don't know how to zoom. Oh, something zoomy just came up. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I don't know how this. So, uh, and now I'm totally in some weird mode. Any Windows users? <laughs> All right. Well, you can sort of see. Uh, I don't know if you can see that at the top. There's a, uh, the query is just in this data, HTML data. Um, and if you change, can I type here? Bop. Nope, I can't. Oh, yeah, I can. If you change the query and uh, go back to the results, you can see that it updates to the new query. Um, and I have on this page, I don't know if you can quite see, there's a um, handlebars template that's embedded in the page. So whatever you put in this handlebars template is what um, shows up on the page. So it basically, whatever you can do a JSON version of your query, it converts that into the DPLA query. And then the, it'll run it through this uh, um, handlebars template so that you can uh, render it on the page. I've got a version of it on GitHub where um, you could 
take your DPLA key, put it in a JSON file, run gulp on it, and then it'll create the library. It's got a gulp task that pushes it to GH pages. So if you wanted to actually publish the combined thing, um, you can do that with a gulp task. And um, so I don't know, I'm trying to, my, my, my pitch to you guys is to uh, think about if you have, if you're a DPLA participant and you wanna have a related items from DPLA, sort of widget on your page, that this is a sort of a start of uh, something like that. And we're, we're planning on incorporating this into uh, into Calisphere, it's in the backlog. So eventually we'll, we'll, it'll come to the top of the pivotal and um, we'll, we'll be implementing this. Brendan? Nice work. Right. So in the uh, true spirit of reporting back from a hackathon, uh, I'm going to um, not only do uh, some stuff live, um, which is exciting, but also uh, just talk about stuff that we've been doing in the, in the last couple of days. Um, so let me start with what we're basing this on. We have been working on an open source app uh, with NARA, I um, should say I'm Rendon from HistoryPin, historypin.org, uh, that has to do with visualizing World War I collections, mostly using it in an educational and museum context. Uh, in the last couple days, we were very inspired by hearing about all of these other uh, APIs that were presented, uh, five of them in fact, uh, and so in a, uh, in, a, in a sudden fit of feeling uh, overambitious, we decided to integrate with all five of them uh, and see what that would do to the app that we were already building. So we have uh, you know, exactly about two days, day and a half now of actually working on this. So I will give you a quick overview. Um, the basic bit of what we were working on, uh, this is great, I get to type on a screen in Windows. Oh, this is so lovely. Um, basic bit of what we were starting with is an application that sure will load any moment now right which is an application that we're working on I'm going to show you a little bit of the uh, the kind of the web version of this which is around a story creation tool so that uh, you can start with collections that originate with uh, Nara ah, this is such a beautiful browser it renders everything so much better than Safari and Chrome is there a Chrome browser in here somewhere yeah. that I can use? Ah, yeah, oh, that would be amazing. Because I have to say that of the things that we were, wor oh, is that is that Chrome? Chrome. I'm in Chrome. Ah, oh, how embarrassing. Not okay. I haven't tested this on Chrome for Windows at all. Um, the the I can't browse anything. This is awful. The ah uh, you don't have Firefox? Maybe I, will. I unlikely. Um, Okay, the, let me show you what we built instead, because this template is just not rendering. Um, so what, what we thought we would do was, was essentially fork our own open source project um, uh, into the brand new address of storyhub at culture.eu. I think it's awesome that we own that domain. Um, as a being a quick tool, we've added some documents at the uh, documentation at the bottom of it, looking very, very, very small on this magnification. Is there a way of actually messing with that to make it a little bit like more human size? Yeah, that's more human size. That actually looks better. So we've added a bit of documentation here with sample accounts and things. Um, the idea is that you can do some searches across all of the application APIs that were represented. Um, at our hackathon on Wednesday, Digital Public Library of America, History Pin, National Archives, Europeana, and New York Public Library, uh, start doing some searches for material. I'm going to guess that this is going to render exactly as well here as the one that as the one that it's based on. Um, yep, yeah, exactly as well. Oh, that is so beautiful. Um, see, I, I came up with lots of adapters, and yet it didn't work with my computer. Um, <sighs> Okay, well, if I can't show you very much on the screen, I'm probably gonna have to make the screen very small. So 
we have material here coming in from a mix of New York Public Library, DKLA, et cetera, based on keyword search, which is a demo that everybody does uh, a lot. What I would actually encourage you to do if you're running, well, the version of Chrome that I tested on, uh, or iOS or Safari, or uh, you know, the version of Chrome that runs on my iPad, or the version of Safari that runs on my iPad, um, is that we can start adding uh, these items that came back through these APIs, adding them into stories that then get stored on the, on the Story Hub called to reuse server. Uh, the original objects stay where they are, we just reference the links from where, from where they are. Uh, and that you can then start adding in chapter titles, subtitles, um, just kind of create a little narrative, create a, share, a shareable thing that has its own uh, little URL. Um, so I have to say, except for my template not rendering at all and therefore not being able to show you any functionality whatsoever, uh, I'm gonna say this live demo was a outstanding success. Um, and I will point you to the um, uh, developer research pa resources page. Uh, on the, uh, in the hackathon document where I've linked both the original one that this was based on uh, and also the version of the template that we uh, kind of created. Uh, in the next week, we will uh, kind of continue to work on the uh, kind of story hub, more general version of this. This is gonna be not exactly something I fold into the app we're working on with National Archive immediately, um, but instead, um, We'll start working on some other sorts of templates, including some fairly uh, much simpler ones uh, and other sorts of account login details, things like that. Um, for the moment, though, uh, I've, I've, given, uh, I've given a login in the, in the document um, that you can use for the moment uh, in order to at least be able to play with creating a story, creating a collection, uh, presumably, on, uh, 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 presumably on, a, on a computer, not, not this one. Um, well, fairly straightforward when it actually works um, based on doing live searches across these, these various APIs in terms of trying to find new stuff. But as I've said, not tested terribly well yet, at least on this browser. So a couple of things working, a couple of things not working, a um, couple of things that I would like to work better, um, et cetera. Uh, and saving and sharing from there. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, do we have Joel and Ricky? No? Going once, going twice, John? Hi, I'm, uh, I'm John Rezig. Um, I'm a developer based out of New York. Um, one project that I'm currently wa working on, I wanted to show off here. Um, I'll just preface this by saying that this URL uh, should not be shared. Um, it's going to be going live uh, next month, but until then, I'm just gonna demo it off. Um, so I've been uh, working with this uh, consortium over the past year called the uh, Pharos Consortium. And it's a group of art history photo archives that are scattered around the globe, uh, a number in the US, a number in Europe. And they specialize in providing uh, of photographs of artworks, so not the artworks themselves. And these are usually used for a study. So uh, uh, art historians would go there and study the, the photos. And one of the things that's really nice about these institutions is that uh, uh, the photos come over a long period of time. So there are photos of paintings in here from the early 1900s all the way up to modern day. And so you can actually get a history about you know, the, when works have been uh, conserved, uh, if works have gone missing. So like the, uh, a number of these archives were referenced um, during World War II and after, for example, to know which paintings have been stolen by, uh, by the Germans and, and, and what have you. So, um, one of the, so the, in the consortium here, they're, they're starting to get their stuff digitized, get it, uh, get it up online. And um, so one of the things I've been doing is building a database for them to kind of house these images. I just want to show it off a little bit. So currently we have about 120,000 images representing uh, 52,000 artworks. And uh, if we, you can, so you, you see that, you know, this is, depending on the, the artwork, there can sometimes be 
you know, many different representations for a single artwork. Let's see if we can find some here. So this is all stuff from uh, about the 16th century. Um, and and the, the institutions themselves provide some metadata uh, that we replicate here. So in this case, this is a, a, an, anonymous, an anonymous work and the date range is incredibly uh, broad. Um, but one of, the, uh, one of the things that uh, I felt would be really important is that you know, these, these archives are providing this information However, uh, the, what, what would be really useful and important is if we're able to build links between the institutions and their resources. And so one of the things I have here is you can go through and find works uh, that are similar to other works um, at another, in this case, at another institution. Um, maybe. I'm not sure if the internet's being slow. All right, try this again. Okay, so these are all works that are uh, that have a similar uh, item. So here we go. So this is a particular painting uh, that is being represented in the Frick uh, Art Reference Library, and here is another copy in the National Gallery of Art Library. Very appropriate, given where we are. And so you can see here the you know. The, uh, the National Gallery of Art has multiple photographs representing this one artwork. Uh, uh, the Frick has one, and uh, you can compare, you know, their metadata here. So, like here, the you know the date is a hundred-year period. Here, it's only a, a fifty-year period. Um, now, this is again, this this is can be very very useful, especially if you uh, find differences. So, like here's one. Uh, the Frick said that this is an anonymous work. They don't know who made it. However, uh, the Zeri Foundation in Italy says, oh, well, this is done by this particular artist. And they gave it a very precise date, uh, whereas this date was a 700-year period, uh, which is almost certainly wrong. And uh, whereas this one is, what is that's 11, 18-year period. Uh, so again, the, the, what, what really excites me here is that institutions, this is the promise of uh, uh, getting institutions to start collaborating with each other, is that you can start to uh, uh, fix mistakes, uh, copy information back and forth amongst the institutions. And uh, so that's, that's, I feel, incredibly exciting. Now, what's interesting is that, at, le at least to me, is that this would not be possible using linked data because nothing agrees with each other. Uh, what well, I should say, not nothing. There's there are things that do agree. However, the uh, there are a lot of cases where they do not agree, and, and this is a perfect example. These things would not have come up as a match for one another. Uh, uh, artist doesn't agree. Date doesn't agree. Uh, categories don't agree. The title doesn't agree. Uh, the only thing that agrees is the actual image itself. Um, so I just want to provide uh, one other example. Uh, let's bring up a screenshot. Um, this is this is another one uh, from uh, four different archives. Each archive has uh, a representation of this particular painting. Uh, they all have pretty much agreement on their on the title of it. Uh, and I should say that the institutions um, are in different languages as well. Uh, some are in English. Uh, we have English, German, Italian. Uh, we'll have a Dutch one as well. And, and again, this is another case where the information, every, there's, there's every single institution disagrees with each other, uh, uh, disagrees in the attribution, disagrees in the dates. Um, and this is going to be very, very useful because now they can start to go in and start to build some consensus around what hopefully the attribution and, and dating should be for this work. Um, so this is something I'm excited about that uh, I, I want to start bringing this to a, a larger audience. This is building off of the initial work I did with the UQA site that was mentioned earlier. But this is all, all the code for this is open source. I'm gonna be open sourcing this officially next month as a thing that people can use. Um, but yeah, so I'll just wrap up there. Right, thank you.
Okay, since Chad doesn't want to talk about his hackathon project, which I will just talk about on, on his behalf. Is that all right? Uh, so mostly Chad, but I spent a little bit of time working with Chad yesterday trying to improve on Ben Armentor's project, hackathon project from last year called DBLA, which is to get Blacklight, which is a framework for uh, building cataloging, uh, catalog interfaces or discovery interfaces on top, of, on top of search indices to work with the DPLA API. And we're really, Chad has made some progress, but it's not really something that's easy to demo right now, especially since we can't, we can't project. So, um, but we'll be sharing more information on GitHub because it seems like a lot of people in the DPLA community, in particular uh, DPLA hubs, are interested in this. So, um, unless anybody else wants to volunteer to do a presentation, I think that's it. Unless people have questions for any of the presenters, because we have a little bit of time. Or, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Brett. Um, so, okay. sorry, in the theme of other people talking about other people's work, um, is Giordana here? I never met you, but I don't want to talk about something that there's somebody else. Okay, so she's not here either. Okay, um, so at the hackathon uh, introduction session two days ago, um, uh, uh, Giordana from North Northeastern. Uh, basically came in with an idea for a project and one of the DPLA staffers, um, uh, Audrey Altman, um, sat down with her and started working on it and both of them couldn't be here so I'm speaking on their behalf just to kind of talk about what they did. But Giordana wanted um, to customize uh, uh, a WordPress plugin that allows you, know, you to embed a search box in a WordPress site that runs off and runs a query against uh, the DPLA uh, API. And, there, and she wanted to be able to kind of pre-filter those queries by partner, by you know institution or some subject terms or something like that, so that people who come and use that embedded search plugin um, don't you know hit all 13 million records, that they only hit the 3,000 or 10,000 records that would be appropriate for that particular case. So Audrey sat down and um, started working on that and is pretty close to having it. Um, so look for uh, either a fork of that existing WordPress plugin or something else. Anyway, that's pretend that was Audrey and Giordana. So, thanks. I guess there are no other questions. Any other questions or announcements? Grievances? Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, this is for John. The uh, similarity between the image that like from the question to the image, so like the one, the one example you showed where like the code that takes the steps to make the image, that specifically kind of goes to that. Uh, yeah. So the, yeah, the question was, yeah, does the image does the image similarity work cross section with the image in the job? Okay. Um, questions feel free to mill about uh, closing plenary is not until 315 so um, feel free to ask the 
speakers' questions, and thanks for coming to the developer showcase.